Good morning, everyone. Uh, Chris and I are going to um, chop and change a little bit during this presentation, so uh, hopefully you'll um, you'll hear from both of us by the end. Uh, the The focus of this presentation is um, what the Internet Archive has learned from doing large-scale uh, web archiving and what they and we have learned from the National Web of New Zealand in particular. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of a background, I guess, around the different things that we do in New Zealand and um, how you know we work in different streams to capture the internet. And then we'll go on, um, and Chris in particular will lead you through some of the, the challenges and the lessons learned from this, uh, this whole program of experience. Uh, but I thought I'd start with some background. Um, and these are some slides I prepared a while ago. Hopefully um, they still work, uh, and I still remember what they are. Uh, but one of the things that I'm frequently asked is, why do we collect the web? And the answer is, you know, well, why do we collect anything? Uh, we have a lot of traditional collections, like you can see there, uh, newspapers, books, and so on. And um, at least 10 years ago, we really started getting into digitization and presenting digital copies of these, both for access and for preservation purposes, mostly for access purposes. And there's a, a recognition that um, digital works are works in their own right. But these days, uh, you know, so much publication is not actually on paper anymore, um, it's online. Um, these are examples of websites that have particular um, political or technical significance in New Zealand, and there's thousands and thousands more. And this is where you know a large proportion of the, the, the nation's published output is, it's online. So um, this has been recognised in New Zealand in the National Library of New Zealand Act of 2003, which was updated again very recently, but um, fundamentally remains the same. Now, legal deposit is the, uh, the concept that um, whenever you publish a book, for example, in New Zealand, you have to give two copies uh, to the National Library, and one goes in general collections, and one goes into the uh, collections of the Alexander Turnbull Library. The, the 2003 Act extended legal deposit to include um, e-legal deposit, as we call it, or electronic documents. And uh, the Act includes a lot of uh, very interesting definitions. For example, an electronic document is defined, and a particular type of electronic document is called an internet document, and uh, this also has a definition. And we, we consider this the scope of e-legal deposit, or online legal deposit, is, is what fits into this definition. And the Act even defines such fairly prosaic terms as make a copy um, as something that now has legal significance. And you can go and look on, online and find that Act. But basically, this Act, um, it underpins all of our web archiving work in New Zealand because it basically sets the parameters for what we are allowed to do and what we are not allowed to do without permission from uh, various publishers. But um, pretty much all of the work that we're going to discuss today um, in our context um, you know, takes place um, under the you know, with the background of legal deposit. Um, not only is this is something that we're allowed to do as a national library under the legal deposit legislation, um, it is something that, you know, we're mandated and required to do by the government as part of our uh, mission to collect the, the nation's public output. Uh, quite a different story for, uh, for example, for a non-profit organisation based in California where they don't have this, um, you might call it legal cover for their collecting activities and they have to take a lot of uh, different decisions about that and some of those things we'll, we'll talk through a bit later on. So at the National Library of New Zealand, we actually have two web archiving programs. Um, one of them is what we call our selective harvesting, and the other is uh, domain harvesting. Now, I, I will talk here about harvesting quite a bit, because that's how we think about it. We think about the capture, but obviously um, archiving is not just about ingest, it's also about the preservation and the making things accessible, and we'll, we'll stray into that area a bit more later on. Um, I'm going to talk about selective harvesting first, because it's a slightly more mature program, and we have a, a bit of an end-to-end workflow in place, and you can sort of see the whole thing, and I'll, I'll quickly run you through some of it. Uh, domain harvesting um, is much bigger, and this is where we need the help of the Internet Archive. This is where we try and get, you know, make a copy of the New Zealand Internet, um, putting aside questions like, um, what is the New Zealand Internet? You know, this is, you know, a challenging thing. And uh, by way of metaphor, I guess, uh, if you think of selective harvesting, you can imagine um, a fishing metaphor, this is, you know, where we go out and grab one thing at a time, and um, we spend quite a lot of time getting that in. Um, the equivalent in domain harvesting would be an approach like this. Uh, we, we take it all, and um, we don't distinguish between the, um, the lovely fish we're after and the, the, the dolphins and things that we should probably leave down there. So, Selective archiving. Um, as I said, this is uh, we've we've got more of an end-to-end -end process here. Um, after yesterday's presentations, I realised that there's something we've we have not really addressed, and that is, you know, this idea of very long-term preservation. I would say that we tend to think about, you know, 
how do we make this stuff available over 10, 15 years when we, you know, we don't, we don't make that explicit, but that's sort of the timeframes we talk about. Uh, we, we haven't really addressed the hard long-term problems, and I'm happy to admit that. You know, how is this stuff going to render in 100 years? Um, your guess is as good as mine. We have enough trouble rendering it now, a lot of it. So uh, this is what we're doing um, internally. We have a tool called the Web Curator Tool. Um, a lot of you may have seen these slides before if you've seen me speak. We developed this a few years ago in collaboration with the British Library. Um, the key things are that we, we select a website at a time, and this is our, our queue of things which are about to be harvested, or um, which were about to be harvested back in 2009, uh, when I made this slide. But it's essentially the same now. Um, these are the things which are coming up, waiting to go, and the top one is something which is running at the moment. And this is a very crafted approach. We're doing one website at a time. Uh, once it's done, this is the list of things which have been recently harvested, or as were at that time. And um, you can see there's little icons on the side where you can go in and view these things and make sure that you've captured all the specific intellectual content that you had selected that resource for in the first place, whether that be the, the information in there or the presentation or some combination of the both, and ma uh, make sure that they're accessible and so on. So it's quite a crafted approach. And in terms of you know, what we think of as our end-to-end -end workflow um, at the moment, um, you can see that uh, this, is, this diagram is basically based on, loosely based on the OAIS model. We've got uh, submission tools on the left, um, the, the Rosetta NDHA archive in the middle, and our viewers on the other side. And the Web Curator tool, when you've finished harvesting something in QA, you click on an archive button and it goes into the NDHA where it will be um, preserved by the people whose business it is to preserve it. Um, we also have an access tool which is part of the, the system uh, which is shown on the side called the Arc Viewer. And the way that works, um, for example, this is a, a screenshot of our new um, National Library Beta online system. We've gone in there and we've searched and we've found a record for a website. Um, I would like in the future for this website to have a nice big sort of preview image on here, but it doesn't for now. But if you click on that big blue, big black button which says, you know, see this online, then you get to go in and see an archived version of the website and you can interact with it and click around it. And um, there's a nice red banner along the top telling you that this is not the real thing, this is an archived version. And uh, the reality is that in almost every case, the, the functionality is degraded in some way. You know, it's never a perfect replica. Uh, we do our best, and as I said, the curators make a decision about whether it's, um, whether it's um, suitable for, whether it's fit for purpose, basically. Why did they select this for inclusion in the collections and then you know, um, are you able to access it in a meaningful way with respect to that decision? Um, since January 2007, when we started using the Web Curator tool, we've done um, just over 14,000 harvests, and generally uh, you can see there about 17% of these get rejected because the quality is not good enough or they weren't able to capture whatever it is that they were trying to capture for or because there's been some technical issue or something, and the rest go in. Um, we have a bunch of harvests from an earlier period as well. Um, 441 harvests, but at that time we were a lot less, um, a lot of the decisions about what made up a harvest was uh, sort of a technology decision and what could the infrastructure bear, and we would pack as much into a harvest as we could, so it, it's kind of hard to say how many websites are in there, uh, if we can even say what a website is at all. So that's selective web archiving, and um, by way of a uh, a short announcement. Um, if you're interested in looking at the Web Curator tool in more, um, in more detail, Gillian Lee, who's um, in charge of our, the team of two or three e-publications librarians who do this work, is giving an informal demo tomorrow at the National Library. So if you would like to um, come along and see it sort of being used, um, find Gillian and ask her about it, or come and find me and I will direct you to Gillian, or really anyone from the National Library can probably point her out to you. And uh, that'll be at two o'clock tomorrow. So um, in terms of the New Zealand web harvests, and this is what we're calling our domain harvests, uh, we've done two of these in 2008 and 2010. And when we first decided to do this, uh, I guess I'm, I'm showing you the slide to tell you the sorts of things that we thought we needed to think about in order to do a web harvest. The scope um, is, for example, the first thing we had to determine. What is the New Zealand internet that we're trying to harvest? Um, it is actually defined by the legal deposit legislation. And I guess with a, a proper reading of the law, you would get a very clear idea of what the scope of the New Zealand internet is. But that doesn't necessarily map to a very clean definition like it's .nz or it's things which are hosted in New Zealand. Um, it's, it, it does get a bit messy around the edges. Um, there's a list of seeds. That is, you know, what are your starting points of this harvest? 
Um, your robots policy is a very important decision. Um, the, 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 the basic question is, um, are you going to honour the robots.txt protocol or are you not, or are you going to choose some sort of hybrid policy? Um, there's a whole set of issues around how much communication and notification you give to people about the fact that you're going to do what could be a fairly heavy harvest of their websites. And that's even before you get to the question of how we're going to accomplish this. Um, you know, it's, it's quite a challenging technical problem. And of course, um, when you're going to stop, given that the, the internet is infinitely large. I mean, we could crawl people's calendars all the way out to 2050, um, and we have, and um, it's not very useful information after a while. So the two harvests that we've done, one in 2008, um, took about 17 days and was about four and a half terabytes, and the one in 2010 took a little longer and was a little more data. Uh, basically, um, we would expect that if we did it again, um, there would be another dramatic increase in size to reflect the fact that there's a lot more video online now, basically. And I think that'll be the story of web harvest into the future. Um, bigger and more complicated data is available to be downloaded. So. Now to flesh out some of those decisions that we made, I, oh hang on, I've got one more thing. So where are we with these um, analysing the domain harvest at the National Library of New Zealand? Um, frankly, we haven't got very far along. Um, our, our approach to this has almost been um, a crisis management approach. Um, you know, the internet is not a very permanent thing, it disappears and our focus has been on capture and getting things in. Um, you can debate the merits of that decision um, at length, however that is the decision that we've taken. Uh, we're now in the position of analysing what it is that we've harvested, what sort of material we have, um, how often should we be harvesting um, if we want to have a, uh, an approximation of a complete capture of everything which is published online. Um, then we start thinking about the preservation analysis. Uh, when we did the first one in 2008, we thought, you know, well, as part of this, we'll develop a preservation strategy and figure out all the things that we're going to do. The reality is that four years later, we still don't really have a preservation strategy for this. Uh, we haven't even answered the question of should they be stored in the National Digital Heritage Archive, although more recently we've been tending towards an answer of um, yes, of course they should. Um, and there's questions about what file format you store things in and so on. Um, in terms of public access, we don't offer public access at the moment, and our thinking around this at the moment, um, in terms of things that we're actually working on, tend to be around public access issues and legal issues, um, rather than the technical issues, and particularly rather than the long-term questions of how do you access a website that was initially viewed in its Gap Navigator 2.0, for example, and so on, so things like that. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to Chris now to um, talk about the, the challenges and lessons from this, uh, from this work. So we're going to actually tag team a little bit on this. Um, what uh, Gordon and I thought might be interesting uh, was to give you a little bit of an international perspective on national domain harvesting around the globe and some of the best practices and issues that we all face as collecting institutions where, when we're deploying and engaging in the, the scale of technology and content collection that the web represents. Um, we're going to flip between kind of this more general context and then um, a more specific uh, set of examples around what uh, translated to the New Zealand context specifically. So one of the biggest challenges that um, most collecting institutions face when they're thinking about trying to create a definition of a national domain harvest is what should go into that definition. And um, for a lot of different reasons that we'll try to cover today, um, the Internet Archive has uh, been able to support a, a wide range of these types of uh, collecting projects just due to the fact that we could assemble the scale required to support them. Um, so what I wanted to try to walk you through was just a couple of, of the opportunities that institutions have for inputs into those decisions. And what isn't widely understood is that a lot of people think, oh, well, it's just a top-level domain. You know, you get a, a list of hosts and you just hoover it all up, right? You just grab it all. Um, there's a lot of nuances around um, the approaches that you take, um, how you try to create a statistically representative sample of you know, even just a body of registered um, hosts in any given domain. And then you also have issues of language, um, uh, culture. Where do you want to pull in resources from other top-level domains that influence 
the definition that you have of your online presence. And for every collecting institution, these are very challenging curatorial decisions that need to, do, that need to be guided and influenced by subject matter experts um, as well as technologists. So it's really very much a collaboration of two very distinct communities coming together to try to create a quality result. Um, for future research and, and access. Now, one of the obvious uh, questions that we always ask um, an institution is, do you have a, a strong relationship with your registrars um, in region? These are critically important um, sources of data that help you understand what's actually being published to the breadth of your domain. So that's sort of a, a first place to start. Um, you're very fortunate in New Zealand to have a strong relationship there, and you do have access to that, that data. That's not true in all countries, um, and not uh, every collecting institution can start from that perspective. So what we do as a backup plan is we will um, mine uh, Google APIs, Bing APIs. Um, we will look at historic data that's in our own um, uh, web archive and try to um, assemble a very large list of target starting points uh, to seed the crawl. And that's just the place that you start and hopefully using a set of well-defined rules will then bound what you collect from, from there moving forward. Um, as I uh, mentioned a little bit earlier, we also have access to data sets uh, because of our presence as a US-based uh, company and a not-for-profit for research purposes. We work very closely with domain name registrars in the states who have responsibility for .com, .net, .org, .edu, and .gov. Um, so we can do uh, IP address analysis that says this resource um, is actually hosted uh, in your regional area that might be uh, a point of criteria for consideration for inclusion. Um, and there have been um, other areas of R&D that we've collaborated with at university levels um, throughout the globe to try to get to the next level. Um, and I know the Czech Republic has, has led um, uh, in this regard in terms of looking at can you do um, uh, language detection on certain resources and use that as a, a criteria for inclusion in a particular collection. Um, you also have to make decisions around what's the content that you, you don't want included. Are you going to actively exclude um, material from your collections? Are you going to uh, take advantage of rule sets that can exclude content farms? Are you going to um, uh, include advertising? You know, is, is that something that you feel is important for the collection that you're creating? Again, every institution has to make their own decisions on this front. Um, and then in general, there is also a, a list of resources that are considered at the core of uh, what any institution considers their domain. Um, and this can either be um, collected through smaller selective harvests, or it may be several thousand resources that are contributed by um, uh, you know, a distributed uh, group of subject matter experts that say these resources have to be represented in any uh, domain uh, capture. So that just gives you a little bit of background on sort of the scope. Um, did you want to say anything? Um, just that the New Zealand experience here was fairly, I think, standard for a country that has its own top level domain. Um, we have talked to the, the domain name commissioner and have access to the .nz um, list of hosts and we also analyzed the .com, .org, and .net um, domain name, or at least uh, Chris did for us, to find the ones which are physically located in New Zealand. That's by no means complete coverage of the, uh, you know, the New Zealand internet, but it's a reasonable approximation. Um, that did mean that in terms of starting out in 2010, at least, we had the zone files, so we could um, make sure we had coverage of all of the domains. Um, in 2008, we took that more ad hoc approach that Chris was describing. <coughs> So we're going to move pretty quickly through the next body of slides because I noticed we only have about seven minutes left and we have a lot of content that we, we uh, assembled. Um, but in terms of the shape of the harvest, um, uh, one of the uh, points of consideration is do you want to create a, a really broad uh, representative sample um, and where do you need to go uh, more deeply into particular resources, or do you have um, an interest in, in running uh, a project that would uh, extend long enough in time to, to go as deeply as you need to in, into resources that might be uh, 
much more sizable in terms of the amount of pages represented or, or resources that are integrated uh, with those particular web properties. Um, this is a, a challenging question to address, and often uh, it's an interactive and um, dynamic process during the course of a, of a crawl um, because content changes so rapidly online, we start with a set of assumptions that say, okay, we're gonna sort of cap collection at this certain level because we think, based on our historic experience, that should be where we're getting quality content, we're not entering the crap that you know tends to come on the edge. Um, but as you get into a crawl, you may find that you saturate that material very quickly and you've got a lot left uh, that you know about, that you've discovered, um, that your crawler has indicated to you, wow, there's links out there that, that may be relevant based on the criteria that you've articulated. Um, these are hard decisions that we have to make sort of in partnership during the course of the crawl between the technologists that are operating these crawls and the curators that are thinking about sort of the overall scoping of those collections. Yeah, although in the New Zealand case, this was a relatively easy decision. Uh, we, we knew we wanted breadth because in those high-value resources we had identified where we did want to go deep, we had the selective archiving program that could cover them off in a lot of cases. So, so this gives you just some statistics on, on an example in the New Zealand yeah, case specifically. Across, across the two crawls, the average was pretty similar, and we, we got an average of around 250 URLs per host um, based on going more deeply into .gov.nz and .ac.nz than anything else. So it's not advancing all of a sudden. There it goes. Um, so we, we, Gordon mentioned these uh, a little bit in, in his introduction, but uh, there's quite a number of, of trade-offs that have to be made. Um, we're a collecting institution that by default um, always respects uh, robots when we're collecting. We don't, we don't have legal deposit mandate. We, we don't. Uh, you know, have that kind of relationship with the, the content that we're collecting. However, when we crawl on behalf of another collecting institution, that's actually directly represented to uh, the web um, masters and publishing community that that crawl is, is um, uh, happening on, on behalf of that might be visited by um, our particular crawler. So there's a, a page that talks about what's the project, who's operating it, if there's any you know, negative impact on the site, how do you get in touch with us? And it's also very clear who is the collecting institution that is behind sort of the initiative so that there's no question in anybody's mind if uh, robots are being ignored in certain contexts um, that uh, why that's happening and, and, and under what uh, set of criteria or decisions that have been mutually agreed upon. Um, one of the key um, areas of best practice that's emerged globally is this concept that if you land on a page and it's not excluded, but you have elements of that page that are excluded, it might be images, videos, et cetera, um, that you collect all of that material in order to be able to attempt to faithfully re-render all of the content that it represents. Um, but depending upon your access that you make available to that collection, if you're inside a reading room, for example, you might be able to expose all of that material to a, a research community. Um, in our case, as I mentioned yesterday, um, we end up having to respect those live exclusions, so you may not be able to see that image redisplayed on a page, but it's in the archival collection, it's in the repository, so that 100 years from now, there is as complete a capture of that particular resource as uh, we could make at the time, given the available technology. Um, in terms of, of this concept of politeness, you're going to only make requests to a particular uh, server as often as um, an end user coming in through a browser would make to that resource. So the goal is not to hammer um, servers and try to pull content um, at a more rapid rate than um, someone just visiting the site might might do. Occasionally there are strange things that happen with crawler settings that um, cause unwanted behaviors. Those are usually immediately identified either by the crawl operator or by the, the site owner and we um, through communication can resolve those quickly by either stopping sort of collection or modifying um, sort of approaches. Um, and one of the things that we always face is sort of, you, you have resource limitations, so you're gonna ha constantly have to figure out how long um, can I run this project for, how much data can I actually store, um, and ultimately collect. And, and the other issue that, that we have um, in the web context, which doesn't exist in other contexts, is you have this concept of time skew. 
you actually don't really want a project to run for three months because the stuff you collected on day one, by the time you're at day 90, um, you know, it's a radically different web that's integrated that resource. Um, we call it time skew, but the reality is you're trying to minimize the amount of time skew. Can, so can you assemble a large enough body of resources to collect quickly and succinctly and try to minimize that skew so that the rate of change on the web isn't affecting sort of the quality of your collection and its interconnectedness? Um, so those are, are some of the issues that uh, come yeah. up. So unlike Chris, um, our default behaviour in the past has been to ignore robots.txt um, unless someone complains, as occasionally people do, but not as often as you might think. Uh, this changes in the domain harvest, though, where um, a lot more people are being hit at the same time. So in the most recent one, we, we mostly honour robots.txt, uh, more or less along the lines that Chris has outlined. This is an instance where a national library, a national institution, has a lot more latitude than the Internet Archive. But um, I think, as Chris has noticed, pretty much all archival crawls will ignore robots.txt to some degree. It's a question of how much. Uh, so this slide just gives you a, a little bit of an illustration of sort of the, the scope of, of some of the infrastructure that we tend to deploy um, for uh, domain crawls. In, in general, given uh, the rate of data capture and um, the intent, we have to dedicate uh, infrastructure for these efforts. It's not the case that we can share it with other um, applications or services. So these are um, you know, dedicated machines that are not only handling sort of the, the capture of, of the data, but also how it's ingested into a repository. Because what, what generally happens is um, you pull in, you write to an archival record called a WARC file, it's an, uh, inter an ISO standard, um, that allows you to record uh, the exact request and all the responses. Um, so the request response pair exactly as you received it from the server. So that gets written to this archival package along with metadata from both the crawler and anything that's been curated or contributed. Um, so that information is then stored in this record and is pulled into a repository system that also then indexes it for access via a tool called the Wayback, which makes it possible for us to run automated quality assurance routines as well as to provide access to the curator communities um, while the crawl is in progress to see what's been captured and where we are um, uh, sort of in process. Um, in general, um, you know, we're, we're looking at about 300 megabits uh, per second uh, per project. Um, in terms of throughput, uh, we can increase that if we need to, but that's that's a general uh, sort of rule of thumb. Yeah, from 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 our perspective, this question looks a little bit different because uh, what we considered was, do we do this in house ourselves, um, following the advice of the Internet Archive, or do we simply commission it from someone else? And we elected to commission it. Uh, large, the, the main driver, apart from cost, uh, was that was having the expertise to deal with the problems as they came up. Um, it's, a, it's something that has to be learned over time, not something you can pick up for a one month period and drop again. Uh, the unexpected issue for us, and I think um, unexpected for Chris as well, that came up in 2008 in which we, we communicated a bit better in 2010 was the international bandwidth. Um, basically, if we're harvesting using um, Chris's uh, infrastructure, everything we harvest has to go across that one Pacific cable, more or less, So um, unless it's already hosted in the US. So that was the, the thing that um, took us by surprise, you might say. Um, so we, we also wanted to summarize just some of the general challenges around uh, web archiving. These are magnified uh, many, many fold when you're trying to apply this to a, a domain scale um, uh, context. It, it's very much the case that not all data can be crawled. Um, a crawler is nothing more than a piece of software that's making a request to a server and getting back um, a body of files and output that um, then get recorded locally in the same way that um, your browser would request information and get something back. Um, in today's world, uh, publishing models are incredibly diverse, incredibly um, innovative, and there's a lot of material that exists purely on the server side or involves very detailed pieces of scripting that controls how you're navigating through information or how information is, is being um, 
uh, either presented to you from the server itself and or delivered down to your client. Um, this makes it very challenging uh, for us to collect all of the material that's needed to uh, faithfully re-render a web resource at a given point in time. Um, so much so that many of us in the community are now promoting the concept of taking an image, <laughs> a snapshot of the web resource using uh, browser emulation to say this is what it looked like um, and you have at least a visual record and a reference point so that when you go back and, and try to move through those materials, um, you have uh, something to refer to. It's also, um, you know, there are complications of, you know, how do publishers opt in and out um, in this more complex world of, of um, legal deposit, especially across international boundaries. Um, we also have, uh, just challenges with making the content accessible. And I'll give you one very concrete uh, real world example that um, we all struggle with currently, and that is um, YouTube videos. So YouTube as a, an aggregator and a publisher <clears throat> of content basically changes their methodologies for how content is served to their users um, about every six weeks. So literally for us to be able to re-render those videos in a way that you could actually click on them from within your browser in an archival setting, we would have to record sort of the rule sets that we use to be able to capture that content and then say, okay, well, it's in this point in time, and so we have to use these rules in order to connect you and rewrite these links in order for you to be able to click on this button and, and view the video. We've had to, to look at alternatives um, and say, here's your, your video report. Here's your list of videos. You can open them in an open source player. And here's the web page that they um, uh, you know, were published uh, to. This is true of embedded video as well as you know, anything that you might collect directly from a channel um, on YouTube. So these are just some of the challenges that we face in the web archiving community in terms of trying to figure out not only how does this play into the preservation context, but how on earth are, are we going to surface this back and, and make this accessible to, um, to users. Um, and the only way we've been able to do this is through international collaboration and R&D. Um, quite frankly, with, with universities, with collecting institutions, um, uh, libraries, archives, um, museums, and so forth. Um, and it's really only come bringing those diverse uh, disciplines and perspectives together that we've been able to keep pace at all. Um, and and I, I should also mention that the commercial sector is incredibly important here. Um, many of our colleagues in Europe uh, benefit tremendously from uh, commercial grade quality tools and resources in region that they can um, use to mine, analyze, and understand sort of their, the data that they're bringing in at this very large scale. Um, we've also seen really exciting developments in sort of the open source context with um, Hadoop and HBase, um, Pig and Crunch, and all these um, tools that now allow us to take very, very large data sets and characterize the individual files, their relationships, the link graphs within them, and also doing that with a dimension of time. So there's really exciting research opportunities that, that come out of, of the challenges associated with this, this space. So I'm actually, um, going to just skip over most of this and um, give you a highlight. I think we put a little too much content together for this presentation. But um, I, I guess what I, one other example I wanted to share with you that a lot of people don't think about sometimes in, in the web context is um, because uh, you know, a collection of web data requires a piece of software, the software has to present itself as something. So the crawl operator and the curators and the project team is making a decision. So am I presenting myself as the Mozilla browser? Am I presenting myself as Internet Explorer? Um, you know, what, am I a, mo a mobile agent? You know, am I an iPad? Um, what content's coming back to me? And depending upon the choices that you make about what user agent you're representing yourself as will influence the material that you're pulling back. And no one today has the resources to crawl as every known user agent. We've, um, we've actually partnered with a, um, a group in the UK that is uh, crawling as like 27 different mobile agents. That's just a small representative sample of all the mobile user agents that, that are out there, but they're the, you know, the most frequent, most popular um, from a global perspective. So we're getting some of that content 
for, via those devices. But you know, one of the ongoing questions we have to face as a community is it's, it's your digital interaction um, that's happening through handheld devices and other interfaces, not just a traditional laptop um, screen. And so the choices that we make in configuring these crawls affect sort of the output of, of the content that's collected at the end of the day. Um, and the other thing is we're never getting everything. I mean, even Google will openly acknowledge that they don't get everything, but they try to be as aware as possible, as quickly as possible, of content as it's entering sort of a broader ecosystem and have some logical way of understanding how it's evolving and changing. Now, when you're visiting a body of content every two years, you can assume that a huge percentage of it has changed. Very, very small, tiny bit of it hasn't changed. Um, but when you're trying to identify how frequently to revisit content, a lot of that gets at how um, you can start to visit a resource, record whether or not it's changed, its magnitude of change, and then apply um, mathematical algorithms to specify when your next revisit should occur. So a lot of the research and development in our community also borders on those types of issues. How do we get smarter? Because we can't use human beings to make all these decisions. We need um, uh, you know, automation to, uh, to contribute. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, this this last little bit, and then I'm going to close out here. Um, there, because of sort of the pace of innovation uh, in the publishing community, um, we have recognized that there is no one way to collect data from online resources. Um, you really need hybrid architectures. You're going to have something, you know, that's maybe emulating itself as a as a true, fully functional browser. Um, you might have a traditional piece of crawling software. You might have someone taking snapshots. You might have someone um, using an entirely different type of tool to collect pieces of the experience. Um, we have colleagues that you know, are experimenting with um, basically filming virtual world experiences, because that's the only way they can um, represent sort of the experience of, of a user um, at a particular point in time in, the, in that context. So, what we're starting to see with, with web archiving is it's overlapping with a lot of traditional disciplines. It's going to be heavily uh, video, image, um, a lot of the uh, file types and resources that many of you are accustomed to preserving and maintaining over long periods of time. Um, so I'm just going to move forward through this. The slides will be available later. Um, we have a lot of challenges. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, we could talk about any of these topics in the... Did you want to summarize with your specific challenges? Uh, why don't we just skip to the, the finale, shall we? Okay. Our final thoughts. Um, so from, from the New Zealand point of view, uh, largely New Zealand faces the same challenges as everybody else here, and um, we do have one or two things we do a little bit differently, um, although this is changing. Um, for a long time, most of the world has had dedicated web archives um, rather than having the web archive as part of your National Digital Heritage Archive, although um, David Pearson's presentation yesterday, for example, implied that they were moving to a similar model where the web was on the same infrastructure as, uh, as everything else. And uh, one of the things which is interesting from, from my point of view is um, asking the question of when will it be uh, feasible to harvest from within New Zealand. Um, certainly in 2010 it wasn't. Uh, it's possible that the thing which will really change matters here will rather than uh, incremental gains will be uh, the government's infrastructure as a service um, model whereby the, the public service has a lot more ability just to spin hardware up and spin hardware down again. Um, alternatively, of course, it may become more economical to keep it in the US if we get enough of Pacific cable um, and bandwidth drops down. Um, Anything to add, Chris? So the only um, last thought I wanted to leave you with is, um, in general, uh, the international community is, is working toward kind of this pie-in-the-sky pie goal, if you will. Um, what we really would love to have happen is that we have these tools and resources that we can assemble into logical workflows and, and best practices that we're able to share those openly and directly with one another across national borders. Ideally, also exchange data for the purposes of, of preservation, if not um, access or other types of, of data mining and characterization. But the goal is that we firmly believe that the best 
individuals to define what any corner of the web you know, should be preserved are the individuals that are actively participating from sort of the cultural, uh, scientific, um, local perspective. So what we're trying to develop is expertise that we can distribute and have regional pockets of uh, groups that are engaged in these very large scale projects with the goal that we're all working jointly to create a whole that, that is more meaningful to um, uh, the international community. Um, we don't believe that any one institution can do this, and we do not believe in any way, shape, or form that any one group um, of individuals uh, can end up sort of identifying sort of the rich uh, material that really should be preserved um, for uh, future research and, and access. That's it? At last. Sorry, we went long.